project was advanced in all areas of development. The increased tempo of the program was highlighted by an expanded production capability. At the end of the quarter, Atlas 3D, the first of a new series, was being prepared for flight from Complex 13. In preparation for future flights, existing launch pads were being modified for D-series tests and to accommodate Atlas missiles with additional upper stages. In the Convair Division of General Dynamics Corporation, the status of Atlas progress is most evident in the manufacturing areas. Production of D missiles has progressed rapidly here in Building 5. At the end of March, missiles 27D through 30D were being fabricated in the major fixture area. Manufacturing techniques developed in the production of A, C, and C series research and development missiles have been adopted for the D series production atlas. The use of optical tooling methods has been increased in the setup of tooling fixtures and jigs and in many phases of missile tank construction. The use of new materials combined with modern manufacturing methods is most evident in the production of the D-series thrust section. The major components of the booster stage airframe are manufactured at Convair Fort Worth. Production here illustrates the increased use of laminated plastics in missile structures. Development of this material represents a significant accomplishment in missile progress. Engine fairings such as this are stronger per unit of weight than if constructed of metals with the added advantage of flexibility. Progress on the Atlas, as well as other missile programs, has been dependent upon advances in electronics. Keeping pace with missile fabrication, is the manufacturing of electrical components and equipment for use on D-series missiles. In the electronics manufacturing area, some 120 airborne canisters were produced this quarter. Assembly line techniques have been adopted for the production of the Azusa transponder package. This quarter, 34 separate units were manufactured by astronautics for Atlas and other missile projects. Additional airborne units manufactured include range safety command and power supply packages, 16 units produced, propellant utilization comparator and mandrels, 16 units produced, telemetry accessory package, 10 units produced, and the autopilot system consisting of two separate packages the programmer, integrator, servo amplifier, and gyro system with 21 units each produced during this quarter. Missile system checkout sets located beneath this dock are also manufactured by Convair Astronautics. Eleven racks make up this unit which checks out missile system performance under simulated flight conditions. Five D-series units were completed this quarter. Two were delivered to the Atlantic Missile Range, one to Vandenberg Air Force Base, and two were retained in the factory for missile checkout. Three units of blockhouse equipment, consisting of 16 consoles each, and 12 Azusa checkout units were also produced during the first three months of 1959. Test lab activities during this quarter centered on D-series missile components and systems. At the autopilot test stand, a study was made of autopilot responses to simulated flight conditions. Signals to the test stand were initiated by electronic computers, which duplicated the effects of flight forces. The test stand is adjacent to the missile assembly area. At Point Loma in San Diego, progress was highlighted by two new developments. Tower D was used for simulated launch and functional testing of the D-series thrust section fairings. This section of the booster incorporates clamshell doors at the launcher arm attach point. In this test, a calculated liftoff rate was used to simulate launch, and instrumentation evaluated the effectiveness of the closing mechanism. An
environmental chamber has been completed at this site. It is large enough to accommodate the entire missile on its support trailer. This trailer is the newly designed operational model for D-series and later missiles. Three missiles were shipped to Vandenberg Air Force Base during this quarter. 4D left on February 19. Missile 6D was shipped nine days later. Last to go during this period was 8D, which arrived at Vandenberg on March 20. d and 6D had been checked out and were in place on the launch pads by the end of the quarter. 8D was scheduled for erection at Launcher C early in the second quarter. During the latter part of March, technicians were preparing the complex for this event. At Launcher B, Convert and Air Force personnel were conducting systems checks on ground support equipment. The first Atlas missile flight from Vandenberg will be from Complex 576-A-1. This will be Missile 4D, scheduled to go in mid-May. About a mile to the north is Complex 576-B. Progress in construction at the end of the quarter was lagging behind the forecasted schedule. This lag was largely in the area of propellant loading systems. Large items of support equipment located outside the launcher building at this complex have been installed. In Cheyenne, Wyoming, construction of the second operational Atlas base is progressing. At Warren Air Force Base, World War II barracks are being torn down to make way for the Atlas Squadron Maintenance Area. Construction will start soon on facilities which will service missiles and equipment for four launching sites around Cheyenne. This area is presently used as a depot for equipment, which will be installed at launch sites now under construction. Completion of the Warren Air Force Base facilities will require approximately 129,000 tons of building materials. By the end of March, the Corps of Engineers was well along on Complex 564-A and 564-B, each of which consists of three launchers and a control center. During the first week in March, a development engineering inspection of the E-Series missile was held at Convair Astronautics. Significant design improvements have been made in the Series E and are slanted toward greater missile reliability and maintainability. A major change in the missile configuration is the Mark III re-entry vehicle, designed and built by the General Electric Company. This second generation nose cone and warhead has been greatly improved in performance and operability. Time of re-entry has been decreased from 120 seconds to 50 seconds. And the Mach number at impact increased to four. This is due mainly to the adoption of an ablative heat protection system. The power driven lift trailer facilitates mating of the re-entry vehicle to the missile. On the opposite side of the missile, instrumentation for the rain safety system is located in the B1 pod. Here, considerable improvements in packaging has been made as in all E-Series systems. This repackaging simplifies manufacturing operations. To my left, at the aft end of the B-2 pod, is the missile guidance set of the ARMA All Inertial Guidance System. This set consists of three units, a missile guidance computer, a gyro-stabilized platform, and a control unit. With this system, Atlas has salvo firing capability and is provided with the highest degree of accuracy and reliability despite adverse atmospheric conditions or enemy countermeasures. A major improvement in missile maintainability has been made in the E-Series booster structure. Many of the pneumatic, hydraulic, and propulsion system components have been relocated or eliminated. Design improvements in the Rocketdyne MA3 propulsion system have been a major factor in this area. The booster engine, which formerly used a central power package with two turbo pumps and a single gas generator, has been repackaged to include a separate gas generator for each turbo pump assembly.
who are looking down on it from 700 miles in the sky. Your eye for this spectacular view is a 16 millimeter motion picture camera thrust into space by an Air Force Atlas Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. On August 24th, 1959, a camera carrying Atlas missile thundered aloft from Cape Canaveral, Florida. Primarily, the flight was for research and development to further perfect the Atlas missile as a weapon system. But this Atlas had an extra assignment, photograph Earth. Hundreds of miles over the Atlantic Ocean, the re-entry vehicle separates from the Atlas. The camera starts. At the upper left is the body of the missile falling free. Cape Canaveral, where just seconds ago this camera rested atop an Atlas, is covered by the triangular-shaped cloud layer. Extending downward at bottom right is the eastern seaboard of the United States. As the re-entry vehicle rotates, the camera sweeps out across the Atlantic Ocean. We're now about 250 miles up. The dark areas are water, white patches are clouds. That large white strip of clouds is a storm front. The arc of the horizon at this point is approximately 2,000 miles across. The camera is making a full circular sweep of the horizon every two minutes. We have almost completed the first sweep. This is Vandenberg Air Force Base, headquarters for the 1st Missile Division of the Strategic Air Command. It is the United States Air Force's first operational ICBM missile base, and spread out over its thousands of acres are launch sites for both intermediate range and intercontinental ballistic missiles. When all upper levels of the missile have been checked and secured, the access tower is removed. Atlas now stands alone, ready. Automated machines will finish its preparation for flight. Minus 70, mark. Have a missile ready, green. Uh, roger, go ahead. Uh, roger, I have a green light. Commit start. Minus 60, mark. Minus 40, mark. Minus 30, mark. Minus 20, mark. Minus 10, mark. followed the flight of Atlas long after it had disappeared from human sight. Less than 30 minutes later, the first operational ICBM flight was history. Atlas traveled 4,300 miles southwest across the Pacific Ocean. The nose cone impacted near Wake Island, on target. A highly successful first ICBM flight for the Strategic Air Command of the United States Air Force. Test vehicles was launched for the MIDAS program, Missile Defense Alarm System, an infrared sensing device mounted on polar orbiting satellites. The Atlas booster performed satisfactorily. 
At time of separation, however, a malfunction occurred, resulting in destruction of the vehicle. On 22 April, graduates of the first class in the Integrated Weapon Systems Training Program conducted the first launch from a horizontal readiness launcher. Atlas 25D was the third operational ICBM to be successfully flown by a Strategic Air Command crew at the Pacific Missile Range. Major test objectives included demonstration of compatibility between the Atlas missile and its ground support equipment, and validation of all airborne subsystems toward the highest probability of a successful flight. Time elapsed for missile erection, propellant loading, and preparation to launch between first alert and booster ignition was 23 minutes. splash net with the most precise accuracy yet recorded in the Atlas program. The missile impacted 200 yards from its target, a graphic demonstration of ICBM Atlas operational readiness and weapon system reliability. was in no way modified to increase normal range capability. Programmed to impact in the Indian Ocean off the African coast, the Atlas 56D re-entry vehicle fell approximately three nautical miles short and one nautical mile left of the target. Since the Atlas guidance system is optimized to give best accuracy at a range of 5,500 nautical miles, the flight of missile 56D is rated as a highly successful demonstration of Atlas airborne system potential. This is the story of the first men who ventured into space. This is not merely a race. We go into space because whatever mankind must undertake, Three men must fully share. Friend hips on a real fireball outside. Former Mercury astronaut John Glenn. He asked, what, what were you thinking about when you got ready to launch? And I think a standard answer for all the group has become, uh, how do you think you'd feel if you knew you were on top of that thing built by the lowest bidder on a government contract? <laughs> the man responsible for building the Atlas missile, Frank Pace. Be down there at the Cape to wonder whether that thing was going to go off, to realize that we ourselves had put 40,000 different parts into it, and there were thousands more that came from other places, and that every one of them had to work to get that thing up. Uh, I got news for you. That shakes you. Uh, I was sitting there uh, uh, really sweaty. Some of the doctors had predicted that uh, in the weightlessness of space flight, the fluids of your inner ear would be moving just random motions instead of being held down by gravity as they are right here. And they felt that when these random motions occurred, it might make you so nauseous you would not be able to even make an emergency re-entry if you found it necessary to do that. So I carried along with me little Tigan tablets to take if I started feeling a little queasy. And then they had designed a, a syringe, a needle, uh, with a spring-loaded uh, needle that if I found I needed this, I could take it out and take the, the safety kit off and hit my leg with it, and it would drive the needle through the suit into my leg and inject the, the uh, fluid. All recorders to fast, T minus 18 seconds, and counting engine start. Godspeed, John Glenn. 10, 9, 8, 7.
And as John Glenn splashes down, his fame skyrockets to epic proportions as a tidal wave of patriotism rolls across the country. The crowd uh, are just something unbelievable, Lou. I spoke with some people in the, in the crowd, people who were here in 1927, 35 years ago, when they had that great parade for Colonel Lindbergh. And they tell me that it was not like this. America takes two giant steps in space. The first and most spectacular is hitting the moon with Ranger 4, here being ready for launching at Cape Canaveral. The complex mechanisms for transmitting scientific data never go into operation, but the triumph of the free world's first spacecraft on the moon is unimpaired. Here the 12-foot Ranger atop its 100-foot boosters arrives at the launching pad. This is America's 10th attempt to cross the more than 238,000 miles of space to the moon, as the Russians did in 1959. Water is sprayed to reduce the heat left by the blast-off as Ranger 4 starts its 64-hour flight that will end just where intended on the far side of the moon. In quick succession, the United States and Atlas made more assaults on the challenge of space. In April of 62, Ranger proves we can impact the moon. Three and a half years of planning and hope go up in smoke at the off-postponed trial flight of the Centaur rocket. This first U.S. attempt to launch a space vehicle using high-energy liquid hydrogen roars off on a promising start toward its goal, 300 miles out in space from Cape Canaveral. But only 55 seconds after blastoff, when the silver rocket has hurtled 20 to 30,000 feet up, an explosion. Much of the planning of placing men on the moon or a capsule on Venus or Mars depended on the success of the experiment. Now the best information it can provide is whatever its twisted debris will reveal of just what went wrong with the Centaur. Even more astounding news from the far reaches of space comes from Mariner 2, which roared off last August for its rendezvous with Venus, 36 million miles and thousands of hours away. Almost precisely on schedule, the intricate communication system begins to pick up signals from our twin planet and relay them back to Earth. Its two sensitive electronic eyes scan the mysterious cloud-wrapped surface of Venus for the 42 minutes that they are near enough. The gap is still some 21,000 miles, but satisfactorily close as astronomical distances go. It will take some time yet for scientists to decode and interpret the signals. These could possibly answer the most tantalizing questions of all space exploration. Is there life on another planet? Status check. Propellants? Go Atlas. Go center. Go center. Pressurization? Go Atlas. Go center. Atlas autopilot? Go. Centaur autopilot? Go. Launch director? Go. Memorial Day. May 30, 1966, Cape Kennedy, Florida. All recorders fast. Minus 12 seconds. Engine start. Minus 5, 4.